gonna introduce me live or is it gonna be uh, it's gonna be live. Oh, oh. it's gonna be live <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Okay, uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the session. I hope everyone's been having a great day and is all set for this session uh, ahead. I am Shantanu and I will be your host for the session. Before we get started, uh, we would like to thank all our partners for supporting and promoting us for this event. Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce our next prominent speaker, Dimitri Winnick. Dimitri is a lead developer advocate at Meta, who focuses directly on projects in the business messaging and open source space, through which he aims at helping developers reach the peak of productivity. With his developer-first approach, he has dedicated himself to the purpose of working on open source projects to create new educational content or give conference talks. He is here to show us the approach that the Meta open source team takes to measure the current state of their open source projects and how we use these metrics to prioritize and direct our focus. Ultimately, we aim to show how by looking at information about your open source communities, your team can concentrate on the quality of projects instead of only the quality of repositories that you make public. Now let's just welcome him on the stage. Uh, over to you, Dimitri, and I think we'll just go ahead uh, with the discussion. Thank you so much. It's a, a pleasure of mine to be here. And uh, it's going to be a recording for the session. But the, the really the core uh, idea here is to focus on Q&A. So if anything throughout this presentation sparks your interest, you have questions or something you want to dive deeper into, the Q&A uh, part will be the, the part where I hope we'll engage the most. So let's get started. Thank you for joining my session today. My name is Dmitry Vinik and I'm a developer advocate on the Facebook open source team. Today I'll talk about measuring open source project health and how to improve it. So let's go. As I said, we're going to discuss measuring open source project health and how to improve it, or I also call this presentation the 10,000 steps of open source project health. So first of all, I'd like to try to establish my credibility and talk about what I do. Uh, I'm currently, as I mentioned, open source developer advocate at Facebook, and we have opensource.fb.com where you can find lots of content from our team. You can find our portfolio of open source projects, our blog, our YouTube channel, our podcast, many different things. But ultimately, our goal is to empower diverse communities through open source technology. I myself uh, focus on mobile pillar at the moment, on projects for Android and iOS native, and also hybrid mobile projects like React Native, for instance, Litho that helps you to build UI uh, dec declaratively for Android, a Fresco, a project to help manage images for Android, and also Flipper that uh, allows people to freely debug mobile applications. And it's just four out of many other projects that are part of our portfolio for mobile. But more importantly for today is that I am passionate about open source, and that's why I'll be talking about it today. And it's not just about Facebook open source. It's more broadly uh, covering open source as a whole. While the exam context is important, uh, this co presentation might not fit uh, projects that are uh, only led by one uh, or two people. Uh, while I'm still having expectations of a certain scale, like a team behind a project or a company, and that's what I will be giving some insight into from my experience. So first I'd like to quickly talk about what is open source. And it's a process of making, making technology available for others to use and improve. And the last two words are the most important ones, use and improve, meaning that we are looking for two main personas at least, our users, users of open source and contributors, those, those who help us improve the project, those who help uh, contribute back to the project. And that's very important to keep in mind. And that's what defines open source. But why people contribute to the open source? Why companies contribute to open source? First, it's the community. People are looking for that community behind the project, project because it's really what at the very core of open source. Leadership, if you are creating open source project 
and you are leading it or you are participating as one of the core contributors to the project, you become uh, an important, ro- you have an important role in that industry, in that area, whether it's AI, ML, mobile, web. And that's why, again, corporations often contribute to open source. Productivity. You have people from different backgrounds, extremely diverse communities in some cases that help improve your project. Uh, you might not think about some accessibility issues, for instance, because your team ha- uh, hasn't had experience with that. And people in open source will be able to do that for you. So it's one of just examples of how productive you can get with open source. But also important uh, thing to keep in mind, it's branding. It can help you with recruitment. It can help with just, uh, you know, ele- elevate your brand as a company. There are just, there are some enterprise organizations that are entirely built on open source. And that's where branding come into play. And if you'd like to see more and hear more about this topic of uh, why people contribute uh, to open source and what open source is, you can watch this Explain Like I'm 5 video, part of our ELI 5 series on uh, Facebook open source YouTube channel, where we covered open source as a topic. So how do people contribute to open source? Uh, Some of the things, and I'll talk about that in length, is through source code, actually making changes to the code base. Some are through documentation, and it's very important. Every contribution matters, whether it's changing the piece of code or changing something in documentation. And that's what uh, it's important for people to contribute, whether they know how to code or not. Translations. Even if you don't see how you can improve the project right now, maybe you have uh, some second language that you know that you can help translate documentation. Uh, And also testing. People often focus on development and forget about testing, but testing is what drives uh, software development life cycle. That's where uh, it helps us to maintain software, and that's why it's very important for open source. And you can contribute there uh, to the open source project as well. And if you'd like to see more about contributing, for the first time, you can watch another video on our YouTube channel uh, on contributing to open source for the first time by Kenny Williams. So, but in particular for this presentation, what are we trying to achieve? What is our goal? So our goals is defining gaps in the open source project health, providing some guidelines. I don't believe in dogmatism. I don't believe on following things that uh, just particular step-by-step instructions, especially for open source, every project is different. So I'm only going to give you some guidelines that you can follow. And more importantly, is throughout this whole presentation, the one thing that will be clear is that communication is the key on every step. So Facebook open source, uh, based on the experience that I've had, is there some metrics that you can define open source health for everything, for every project out there? And the short answer is no. The long answer is, as every consultant would say, it depends. Uh, There is some metrics, obviously, that you can use. uh, There are potential health metrics like uh, repo numbers, you know, whether it's stars, watchers, forks on the GitHub or GitLab repository. Uh, It's your um, forums like Reddit, uh, Stack Overflow, or other Q&A chats that uh, you can collect. Uh, sentiment al- analysis or just seeing how many questions people ask and how interactive people are. Uh, Twitter and YouTube or other, again, areas where people can talk to each other, whether it's you know Slack or Discord. Uh, and there is also something called Orbit model. Orbit is basically, model is the model behind this great website, I believe, uh, Orbit, that helps people to try to define some metrics and uh, grow the community through um, pres- quite prescriptive methodologies that I invite you to give a try, um, but I'm not going to go uh, dive deeper into that here. So instead of looking at numbers and this particular metrics, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'll talk about more conceptual approach, what things to look for, what kind of guidelines I can give you uh, to hopefully find what works for you and improve your project. So uh, that's why I'm covering guidelines today. And so, as I said before, it's not about Facebook, but I'm still thinking about large scale. So in general, there are five types of open source work you can think of. And uh, the types of work that we'll discuss are planning, branding, documentation work, and code base work, source code work. So let's go one by one. Let's look at planning first. Uh, why do we want to open source project in the first place? 
you know, open sourcing project for the sake of open sourcing is not a reasoning. You have to know exactly why you're open sourcing something and how you're going to uh, wind it down eventually. Are you going to uh, have a world domination or are you going to sunset or archive it down the line? Think of that. Maybe you're going to move it to a foundation or do something with it. Uh, you have to keep that in mind at the very first stage of open sourcing. Even before you even open source, at the time of launch, you have to have a plan uh, you know, behind your actions. Possible goals that one can have and should kind of acknowledge is recruiting, trying to recruit people to your organization or even maybe to your project uh, through that open source work that you're sharing. Contributions. You're actually looking for people to contribute and improve your project that you are going to use internally, maybe, or as an enterprise supporter of the project. Branding. Again, that's very important as maybe you're trying to position yourself as an organization, open source organization as well. And adoption. You're actually trying to dominate the market or maybe become a big player in the market. And that's where, you know, another UI framework might come into play and it's, it would be a good example. Always think long, long term. Uh, the, the, but the important thing overall is that you have to have your team's commitment. Whoever is behind the project, at least in, especially initially, need to know that they are doing it for the, they have a passion for it. They have a commitment to support it. They have on call if there are some GitHub issues that pop up or PRs, how fast would you review them? Think of it in the enterprise terms, like uh, you have a SLA, basically you all have expectations to reply to folks online within a week, maybe a month, uh, maybe a year even, but still have that expectation set with your team ahead of time. When it comes to branding, Branding basically, let's see, uh, is not just about marketing. We're not thinking marketing uh, as it's usually said. Marketing often is uh, viewed negatively. Instead, it's really about showing commitment from your uh, project when you actually think about branding a bit more. Branding, you can think of naming. You actually thought of a name. You did some research. You Googled that uh, when you, let's say, have a, some common name. Pandora, for example, and you try to Google for it and you see Pandora is a jewelry store or uh, a b common brand that people have and search, search engine optimization will downgrade your project way down the line. So you have to think about proper name, especially when it comes to packaging as well, like NPMs or some Python packages. Logo, even if you're not trying to pay some expensive designer uh, to create a logo for you, something easily drawn by you or your team. Actually exciting, maybe get community involved and draw a logo for your project. Uh, have a narrative. How are you going to position your project? What is it for? What problem it's solving? Document it in a readme. It really shows your commitment. Branding is one of the ways uh, we are seeing the commitment from the project. And social media. Maybe you, know, you don't have to actually have a Twitter account or Facebook account, but maybe reserve a name for you. So your project can be, uh, you know, uh, shared with the community where your community resides. Maybe it's an email list because your community primarily uses emails. So think of that too. For documentation work, uh, documentation is one of the cornerstones of open source. If you look at the top projects just worldwide, they all have amazing documentation. People spend hours and hours, days and months, years on making sure it's as good as possible, as accessible as possible, um, you know, as welcoming as possible. So it's really what often makes or break the project. Documentation, it's great for contributions, especially first time contributions. Uh, it makes it searchable. People can actually find it on Google uh, or elsewhere or even on a website. That's where a website is quite handy. And again, creating the website helps people to find you find your project, not just on a README. README and just uh, mark down files on your repository, uh, it's limiting. But the website with a search bar and uh, some quick guidance, uh, frequently asked questions, really sets project apart from many others out there. Consider user using AlexJS. AlexJS finds um, non -welcome, unwelcoming words that you might be using uh, by biased language Things of that sort that really helps uh, this AlexJS linter helps you to find and exclude from your documentation. So do things of that sort. Make it welcome. Uh, make your project welcoming to other more diverse 
uh, backgrounds. The last part that I, uh, open source work that I want to cover is code base. The code base, obvious, the important things to mention are code of conduct. You want to make sure that your community has code of conduct established that uh, kind of guides how the community behaves, uh, how you deal with bad actors, uh, how you navigate some conflicts or what you establish as the environment in your project. And there are lots of great examples of where to grab the code, con code of conduct from. README is what people first see on GitHub or GitLab. So make sure that one is well-defined. You explain what you're looking for, why it's there. So it's, it's, it's very important uh, to have proper README for your project. Have contributors guide. If you are looking for contributions, you should have a contributors guide. So they know how to get started, how to build your project on their local machine, how to have it in development mode, how to make the pull request, have a pull request uh, form for them, a template, if you're using Git GitHub, for example. Uh, and again, PRs and issues, it has to be part of the contributor's guide, but as I mentioned, have a template. With GitHub, you have a great way to establish what you're looking for when someone files a pull request or an issue. You don't want to have a back and forth with uh, whoever filed one of these items on uh, have you if it's a failure of a test what's your reproduce reproduction steps uh, what did you expect to happen what actually happened make sure you define that and because if there is some uh, uh, vagueness it usually will be filled with the confusion or just uh, back and forth you want to avoid back and forth maintenance uh, maintenance cost of open source is actually quite high and that's where problems usually arise and it makes your project health worse so keep that in mind so we talked about planning branding docs and code base quite a few things but last last but not least thing i want to mention is the community work it's a thing of its own and it's important on every level of every level of open source work and that's why i kind of define it as a separate thing it's team driven uh, it really has to come from your overall team. Uh, often it's focused on contact co content, so make sure that you uh, the community knows your team. They know where they, they contribute, how to contribute, how to learn your projects, things like tutorials, uh, videos, podcasts. Uh, it again goes back to branding even, uh, but make room for others to produce that content. It's always exciting to see uh, in some space, especially web space, how many tutorials people outside of the company or a team that originally created the project created. Uh, that, again, content driven by the community is always best. Have a community space, place for people to congregate, uh, to connect with each other, ask questions. Have a Slack channel, Discord channel, uh, place for people to go and uh, you know s see the team that behind the project ask again ask a question and if you actually see more questions popping up in those spaces move them to frequently ask section in on your website on your documentation so everything is interconnected with your community because open source is all about the community and communication is the key if you don't tell your t your uh, project um, contributors or users what to expect they might abandon you, they might abandon the project, and it's the lack of the uh, communication that usually leads to disaster. So I've talked about many things here. Uh, call for action that I would like to leave you with. Focus on the communication. It's extremely important to talk to your audience, know exactly uh, what they're expecting. Maybe share your roadmap, share exactly that you're not expecting contributions or you're looking for contributions. What stage your project is in? Is it production ready or is it still in beta alpha whatever it might be make sure you clear that up with the community that you are trying to reach but you know your community that maybe you are in a space that well known or it's a brand new space space like blockchain and nft whatever it might be really know who you're working with and who you're building for and that's where you target them with Community space, maybe again, they're using email lists only or you on, they're only using Slack or Discord, whatever they might be using. So know where your community is at. And still, even though I said metrics and numbers, it's hard to define, collect that metrics. Down the line, you'll see some patterns that will uh, hopefully align with your project, with your community, and you can actually define pr uh, metrics and success 
uh, criteria for you and your team. So thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Dmitry Vinik. Please reach me on my Twitter, blog, LinkedIn, or email me directly if you have any questions. And I'm excited to, uh, you know, you working on open source and thinking of how to improve it. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Dimitri. I think it was really wonderful uh, listening to you. Uh, and I think we have definitely learned a lot about open source project health in this video. But is there anything else that you would just like to add on over to that? I mean, it's always right. It all depends. Um, as you've seen, I don't really I didn't really focus on Meta or as they used to be called, like Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, open source as much. It's more of a general principles that uh, would be applied uh, applicable. Uh, to medium size to large size companies and engineering teams. And so ultimately TLDR, communication is the key, but more importantly, it's just good planning. The, you know, recently, yesterday actually, there was there's a university in uh, South America that's been collecting some open source stories, right? They were reaching out to some experts asking our opinion on a variety of topics in open source. And uh, one of those questions were about challenges that companies and uh, individuals encounter in open source. And really, lack of planning is, the I think, one of the core challenges that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Meaning a team might think, oh, right, let's just open source it. It's going to be great. We're going to feel great. But if you don't think of it, in, regard, in the same way you would think of any other product. You know, you would create a MVP, right? The minimal viable product, making right. sure it works. You try to share it with the community early, considering your community being your customer. Uh, but you also want to, you know, what, what is your goal? Is it IPO, like in the startup sense, yeah. or is it keeping private and bringing in more contributions? Uh, and ultimately, how are you going to, uh, you know, wind down the product? Uh, or the project, whatever we were talking about here, are you going to give it to foundation? Are you going to keep it being open source and actively contribute to it? What's the structure? Because if anything, stale projects, you know, that just exist out there, mm -hmm. that's, I, I don't know, it contributes to the quantity problem versus like the quality. I would rather have quality pro projects than the a huge quantity of them. I think that's really uh, wonderful to hear and helpful for everyone as well, hopefully. Okay, so we have a, a few questions that have popped up. So I'm right. just going to uh, put them on stage as well. So here's the first one from Mahati. Uh, what are some uh, of the oldest projects that Meta has as of now? Oh, right. Uh, uh, we have like over 700 projects. Like you can, you can Google um, Meta year in review. Uh, blog posts, uh, Meta Open Source Year in Review blog posts uh, that um, we've been publishing for the past I have no idea how many years, but for quite some time. And so those those uh, posts we usually start with nice infographics outlining you know, quantity or basically the brief metrics, right? How many people contribute? How many projects there are? How many commits we've seen from the external and internal contributors? Uh, and we try to kind of uh, separate those. Because it's not just about us contributing, but again, about our community contributing back to the projects. So, yeah, it's it's a massive portfolio. Um, if anything, the way we kind of uh, divide and conquer those is we split them into subsections and kind of uh, categories, or you can think of them like departments in the organization, right? We would have AIML projects. We would have um, reality, you know, um, AR, VR these days, right? There would be something in development tools, so basically productivity and things of that nature. And nowadays, I also kind of step into business messaging, like WhatsApp, with the release of uh, WhatsApp Business Platform API. So uh, that's how we kind of divide this, you know, huge quantity of projects, and we try to focus on each of them. Uh, again, depending on the plan of the team, because some of these projects within the 700, right? It can be a read-only open source project, meaning it can be some code that accompanies a white paper, right? One of the, like many of us that are just you know, in development, we don't quite know how the researchers operate. 
and they actually rely on open source quite a bit and they share their research and their uh, work in a public manner and so what they like to do is publish a paper but also a code or something that people can you know reproduce themselves and that they can also count towards the 700 projects right uh, when I say 700, by the way, I actually mean active projects, so I don't even count archived. Because when you archive a GitHub repository, it becomes truly read-only. And that's really not what kind of contributes to this high quantity. But what I wanted to highlight is by knowing the goal of the project, I know exactly what to focus on and how to further grow those individual projects. But we can dive into a you know, specific area that people might be interested here. AI, ML, DevTools. I have insight in all of them if you have questions in those. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful to hear. Uh, all right, so we'll just move on to the next uh, question from uh, Muthu Kumar. Uh, in my opinion, in future, most of the current commercial products too will enter into open source. What are your thoughts on this? In future, most of the current commercial products too will enter into open source. I wonder if it's meaning those commercial tools will be open sourced or they will rely on open source a bit more and kind of acknowledge that we can think of that you know question from the, both of those parts i think the main question really here is tools being open sourced but i actually like to consider the other parts of the co you know side of the coin of com companies also relying more on open source and um, actually paying attention to that so let's look at the first part um I don't know whether more companies will be open sourcing their stuff because not all, all no not all organizations would want that because again the the goals I highlighted for um, organizations basically the benefits right leadership productivity and you know general community right if the company is trying to establish itself as the one of the big players in the space basically working toward this leadership position, credibility position, then open source would make sense. But they might not be looking for uh, contributions as much. They would like share their stuff. So let's say we talk about some privacy uh, oriented company, so authentication product, or, you know, I recently been like changing my password manager, right? I would very much be interested in making sure the code is public. Because in that case, I, you know, have a not myself, I'm not an expert in this space, but I can ensure, I kind of trust the community to already go through the code with fine, you know, tune comb to find any concerns that there might be any. And in that case, you know, this product becomes one of the leaders in the space, at least for me. Uh, if it's about community and people in the project actually is trying to, you know, grow it and increase the adoption and become a important part of that space like you know obviously if i say web i have to mention react or many other projects in that space uh or if we talk about uh productivity you know we had some cases with um ios open source product projects where uh, or not just ios some cross-platform uh, oriented open source projects where we at meta might have implemented support let's say for android right or for some other operating system. But the community created pairing integrations for those projects for other operating systems. You know, it might be uh, you know, something different, like for Windows desktop, which we haven't, let's say, did not really target initially. And the community, by implementing it, helped us internally also use that uh, you know, new integration. So in that case, the productivity aspect of it is that it saved us working out, right? But we're also obviously you know, working with the community, so it's not just like it's not just as simple as that, right? So uh, yeah, it depends really on the goal of the company. So if it, if these three main points, community, productivity, and leadership, aligns with the company's goal, sure, they will open source a lot more. But if not, uh, I, it's hard to say. More and more will open source stuff. Like with WhatsApp, we've open source WhatsApp API quite heavily, cloud APIs we call it. And uh, yeah, our goal, one of the goals is to make sure that we work with the community to, to make it better. So we have a variety of goals, but I can't really say it's going to be more and more popular for other organizations to do it. I think there'll be more with the recent news in open source, right? Uh, in the past couple of years that you might have seen, I think people are going to stop taking open source for granted 
and start valuing it, valuing it a lot more and the contributions that people make. And so if anything, those companies will now think about open sourcing and the planning before they actually pull the plug, uh, they basically pull the trigger and, uh, you know, open something, open source something. But uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> I can go in, on a tangent, but I want to also be able to answer other questions. Too. I think that's that's been really insightful. Uh, you've just tried to cover all the aspects that could be there uh, to companies diving into open source projects. All Thank right. You. Uh, hopefully that answers Muthu Kumar's question as well. I'm not quite sure when is our when is the session ends. I want to make sure I don't go on a tangent for too long. Uh, we still have so 40 minutes, so I think we still have time. Oh, great! So, awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next question we have is from Manish. Uh, can there be a commercial version of an open source software? Of course, of course. There are actually quite a few examples. Uh, like I, th I think I've seen. Great. I you know I like YouTube. So, you know I, I, I watch it quite a bit. <laughs> you know we say we don't watch TV anymore, but then we spend so much time watching Netflix and YouTube, but or Hulu or whatever else. But um, uh, I've been watching one of those nice short uh, videos from New York Times or whoever else. I don't quite remember, but they basically do like analysis or uh, kind of insight in like a freemium model of open source. There was a nice piece on. And you know, gaming en engines, I believe like Unreal Engine and uh, Unity, w w Unreal One is actually open source, but the way they license it, the way they work with developers, it actually brings in money and quite significant funds. So there is definitely like in different areas, of course, gaming is just one of like a niche area. And that's what I kind of uh, wasn't as involved in. And I kind of researched it a little bit following this a piece that I watched, but there are so many other examples, right? Uh, if you look at uh, oof, uh, the um, many, many projects with operating systems, like Linux operating systems, like Unix-based ones, uh, there would be some that, you know, make it, for, make it open source, free to use, but they all provide consulting services for installation, for support, for maintenance. And there are so many different projects uh, like that, right? There are so entire consulting agencies that, let's say, uh, support like React development, right? Or writing courses. You can even think of that as well. Like React, if anything, I really enjoy it for just sheer value it brought to the world by people making a living on not just using the project, but also contributing, creating the educational content. Uh, you know, I don't have to go far. You just Google how many people you know, for publicly shared on the you know the the money they made around it and the value it brought to them. So if yeah, there are many different versions you can commercialize it. Um, consulting, I, I see with more and more projects, and actually it goes back to the previous question. If anything, there are some companies and startups that I've talked to recently uh, whose entire model is open source SDKs. Uh, or I work with one agency that focuses on SEO and they basically would take snapshots of the website. And so some, you know, they can actually serve those snapshots to search engines whenever search engine comes in. Uh, their code, entire code base is open source. So if anything, someone could have replicated it. But when you are, I don't know, a big organization and you have other things to worry about, you have your other goal, like your business goal, is not taking snapshots, it's something else, I don't know, selling something, uh, selling courses. You don't really care, uh, you don't really wanna have yet another thing to manage, have AWS or Azure or whatever else running this new service yourself. You would actually pay, most likely the creator of the project to run this service. Or Ghost, the blogging platform, you know, uh, or WordPress, it's open source. You can run it yourself if you wanted to, but, you know, some companies, some people would just pay uh, a service to host, manage, upgrade, as it's a lot of work. And, you know, the I personally, you know, earlier in my career, I would really be excited to build it myself, to do it my, everything myself. But later, uh, with different goals, I, um, I would rather pay someone to handle it, even if it's open source. So, yeah, I hope that answers this question. So, yeah, there are definitely many opportunities for that. Plus, you know, many uh, funding opportunities. There is Open Collective, there's a GitHub funding, 
there's a bunch of other uh, uh, platforms these days to support open source developers, and you definitely should do that. Or your company should do that too. That's really uh, good to hear. All right. Uh, so the next question we have uh, from Jatin Kumar. Could you share any life experiences on contributing to open source? And I think that's a really interesting one. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. I can't talk about many of the things I am involved, but I can talk about things that I, uh, I look, I, I've seen other people being involved with. I think there was one great um, article I, I read. Um, I think the project was called Parser. There was, there was a tool, um, very big in PHP, in PHP space. And the developer, uh, the, again, whatever he created was, again, widely used. And if anything, and the main thing that, I, again, I want, I want to kind of bring back to my talk, what I liked the most about his post was why and how he's winding down the project, or as people call it, sunset the project, right? And I think that's actually least... Uh, talked about topic, right? Everyone likes to talk about things that, uh, you know, how to contribute the first for the first time. Uh, there is actually great, nowadays there are great uh, yeah, websites that help people to find their first bugs to handle, uh, you know, this whole tagging of first got issue. That story, anyone hopefully on the, who's listening to this session can actually go themselves and enjoy that uh, life journey, right? Because it's it's a journey. By just by simply fixing something small, it might appear small, like a, I don't know, uh, adding another language localization or fixing a typo. That alone uh, will kind of bring you and give you that life experience. But you don't often get life experience of winding down or sunsetting a massively used project. And so what this person did, he went through uh, going on how other people try to take over his project. Some, you know, someone who's never even contributed, they said, we can take it over. And But he made the conscious choice of, for the sake of integrity, to just make it read only, saying, if you want to, you can all fork it. That's, again, that's the great thing about open source. If you like it or you want your own company to you know, manage it, just fork it, right, and have your own thing. You can even make it private if you want to. But uh, it's up to you to you know, copy that code. And go your own way and so uh yeah if anything i would recommend search for these examples of winding down um projects like that they would give you the most interesting like life experiences uh you could ever get um i wouldn't have one of my career life experiences with open source if anything it's been great to me I, again i i started uh, speaking uh at the testing conferences uh open source testing software, Selenium, that's where I met a couple of the organizers uh, as well. It was my, my first time speaking in a Selenium conference in India. It was great. Uh, but I also traveled the world quite a bit because of open source. So that's been exciting for myself. But yeah. Great. That's, that's great to hear. Uh, the next question we have is from Tamalika. How to contribute to open source as a tester? It depends what you would what you mean. You mean you can say as a tester by contributing test coverage. That's one way. Because I'm telling you, there are so many memes online on the fact that's like it can be in production for years. You would be surprised how crucial the software, the open source software, might be for the entire world and how little tests it might have. Uh, I've seen I've seen entire articles that are dedicated of how to fool linters when the PR goes, pull request goes through to make sure that kind of test coverage is there. You know, it would like, the, that article would go into uh, explaining how to create like uh, dummy tests with the for loop and create like a thousand of them that in that way you have a code coverage of like 100% almost. Uh, or there is that called assertless testing, right? You have a bunch of tests, you just never do a cert. And so you have 100% coverage, all passing. So what I'm trying to say is uh, there are many projects you can find uh, that are actively, you know, quite popular, but with very little test coverage. So your expertise as a tester, full on as a tester, would be greatly appreciated there. Because you would, you know, you don't need to sell tests anymore. People understand the value of it. 
they just don't know how to write them or it gets like on a low, low on the priority list but really the time they support and maintain and trying to debug something test tests well worth it so if anything that's a great cont contribution um also you know myself when i wasn't really uh, technical in some areas i would try to contribute to documentation um because those are the skills like problem solving or you come into a project as a newbie you have a fresh pair of eyes so what might have been obvious to a developer who's been you know who had been there from the very beginning of the project something they might overlook or they haven't actually built their project from scratch and you as a new newbie to the project might have encountered something and we might have a special setup right some windows 98 or something that no one else has and then you now can actually contribute and document that process uh, but again the testers are developers if anything you can then step into the actually writing the, that code or full-on work on open source projects in a testing space right selenium alone that's a good example uh and there are many other projects in that space too that you can think of yeah and i think with that you have also answered another one of questions that has popped up do you need lots of experience to be able to contribute to open source uh, no go to meta open source youtube channel you'll find the video that one of my colleagues made about first time contribution first time contributing to open source uh it's how to covering how to how to kind of find those uh, first issues in prs and how to actually get started uh if anything uh it's like with anything it's called like imposter syndrome right without ourselves but you just have to start so i'd say even the smallest thing uh, thing you can think of like again documentation just for me it's not to devalue that's why i don't, I don't bring up documentation so often just because i devalue and i say how easy it is it's actually extremely hard but like right now, I, you know, I use I use English to communicate. I know a couple other languages. I can you know, talk in those, and maybe the way I talk, I can as well write in the same language. Writing code, uh, it's the same thing as communicating with the machine. It might not be something we do on a daily basis, right? I don't I don't speak like ones and zeros to my laptop all day, uh, but I can speak English all day, and so that's why it's much I don't know which much we just much more confident. Uh, with writing in the same language we communicate in that's where helping with documentation will help you and when you clone the repository you make a change to docs you then push it back you make a pull request that pull request gets comments like um, you know at the description you learn how to title your pull requests you go through this process once you merge then you have to actually update your uh, fork and by the way, you had to fork beforehand. Going through those steps alone kind of removes all the hurdles. So the next time when you make other changes, you already walk that path. It's almost like, uh, I don't know, I don't know if people ski, for example, like you or you bike. When you bike or you ski in the unknown terrain that's no one been to before, it has no tracks, no bike tracks or no skiing tracks. But after you walk that path once or someone walked before you, it's much easier and smooth to ride through those tracks. That's really the gist of it. I, I think that's a great analogy, uh, Dimitri. Thank you. Think... Came, up, came up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I think uh, we just have time for one last question. Uh, all right. Which are some of the underrated uh, open source projects cooking up nowadays, uh, in your opinion? I, one of the great projects I've seen called Alex JS. I mean, I brought it up, but it's great how you know um, easy it is to use. It's like a, it's a linter, Alex.js. It's a linter that you can run your docs through. It will help you identify those. Uh, biased language that you might have you know overlooked right um you know even today right during my q a i mentioned i said something like pull the trigger right it's, it's you know it just slipped through but it's something that i would try to avoid using because 
just the we should be worried of the uh, you know we should be thoughtful of the language we use whether it's written or spoken because in that you know what might appear natural or easy to one person especially when we go open source which is global mm -hmm. uh we might not be um you know conscious enough of uh people with different backgrounds with different you know uh different kinds of people and so as a result alex Trias, it's a great product a project because it helps to identify those so it it uses this power of open source trying to make the pro projects and the space more welcoming more open hence mm -hmm. the open source thing right so i would say that's an interesting one i would look at a bit more on how you can use it on your day-to-day -day. Uh, if you really want to like jump on a web ui uh, you know train hype train a bit more you're welcome you're welcome right there's so many new open you know ui frameworks out there uh every day there is a new one pop up so you can also play with those but i'd say it's you just have to find what you're passionate about and work on those yeah makes sense and i think with that our time is also up again i would just like to thank you a lot uh, dimitri for that wonderful session and i hope everyone here also found uh this insightful uh, we would also be hosting all our recorded sessions on YouTube, so you can go back and listen to them again and share them with your peers as well. Uh, hope you have Thank a great you. day ahead and happy testing, everyone. Ask me on Twitter anything. If you want to have any questions, reach out to me there or email me. I'll, uh, I'll reply. Thanks a lot, Dimitri, once again. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye-bye.